Welcome to Catch you Outdoors. I am your host, Captain Rob Modis. My contact email is catchoutdoors at gmail.com. My website, catchoutdoors.com. And the Facebook page is Catch you Outdoors. My most recent book, Bridge to Paradise, was released this past November. It's available on my website at catchoutdoors.com. Those copies will be signed. They can also be purchased along with my first book, What I Know About Fishing, Southwest Florida, <laughs> on Amazon Kindle. Today's episode is number 23, titled More Random Thoughts, <laughs> or I Couldn't Come Up With a Title. <laughs> Might be the more appropriate thing. There's a lot of stuff out there in this past week for me, so I just had a few things I wanted to cover and talk about. And I'll just kind of see where this goes, because to be honest with you, I wrote a very, very short outline. Normally, I'm a, a detail person, and I thought it would be more fun to kind of do this on the fly. So I'm going to start off with uh, what's in the news. Today is Friday, uh, as I'm recording this, and uh, Ukraine is completely gone on oh, its left ear, thanks to Russia and Mr. Putin. Um, uh, not a lot of thoughts about this. I mean, I'm really watching it carefully, obviously watching it from a our U.S. stock market point and U.S. fuel. Um, I, find it, I find it terrible. Let's just put it that way. It's terrible. These people are, um, I would call, mostly innocent civilians, and they are willing to fight back. They're going to become rebel soldiers, I guess, based on what I've been reading and seeing. And I, I try to put myself in their position here and imagining a country coming in against us and what would happen and how we would react. Um, it's just, it's unbelievable. Uh, I personally think Putin may have bit off more than he can chew. I hope I'm right about that because I think the resilience and the resistance of the Ukrainian people might be pretty, pretty big. Um, and I now officially know that Putin is crazy. Crazy as a hoot owl. So that's my personal opinion. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. Anyway, so uh, I'll keep uh, keep an eye on that. I guess the biggest U.S. concern is in, in our weird, selfish way is fuel cost. And, of course, they are screaming upward. Um, 50 cents in most areas. They said 5 cents in some. Shoot, California went from 5 to $6.10, I think I saw this morning. And I would imagine that other areas will be like that. We're very fortunate in Fort Lauderdale. I've mentioned this before. We we have the fuel. We're the distributors for the entire south area of Florida, all the way over to Fort Myers and uh, Okeechobee south into the Florida Keys and up the east coast a pretty good ways. We, we I mean, that's what we do. We have an enormous port here that happens to uh, bring fuel. But I, I nobody can predict the future. So, But there's some scary times ahead. I know that. And... Uh, I hope it stays within the boundaries of Russia and Ukraine. That's that's my thoughts on it. So, uh, second item that popped into my head this morning today was is February twenty fifth, and I'm sitting here thinking, wow, that's a that's a date that is that somebody's birthday or is that uh, someone's anniversary? What is that? And then it dawned on me, wait a minute, it's me. Um, that was the date back in twenty fifteen that I wound up in the hospital. Um, thinking I was going to die, quite frankly, uh, cancer, cancer got me officially. We did nobody knew what it was for about a week, but, um, I had a near death experience. Uh, I thought I was sick for about three days before that, the flu, basically achy, high fever, able to control it with, uh, taking Advil's and I just got sicker. I just, I'm like, this will go away. And I kept fishing, by the way, I, had, uh, in February you were fishing. Well, Yeah full-time guides fishing every single day. And, um, I just got sicker and sicker and I got sore and sore and my muscles ache, my bones ache. And pretty soon I could barely move. And thank goodness for a buddy named Steve at the Marina who was kind enough to load me into my truck and drive me to, um, or was it his vehicle? I think it was his vehicle left my truck. Anyway, I don't remember a whole lot after heading for the hospital. The, the pain was crazy. So that was seven years ago that that day happened. Uh, it was a horrible first three or four days. Um, I really didn't think I'd make it. Um, I've never experienced pain like that. And I hope I never do again. Uh, but I will say this, the fishing community, my family, all these wonderful friends and people that are in my life, they really came, you know, to the game. And, um, 
I'm doing pretty well now. Uh, my cancer's in remission. It's still there. Um, I have a thing called multiple myeloma. And it's not melanoma. <laughs> a lot of people thought, oh, Captain Rob got that from being in the sun. No, no, no. It's a, it's a totally, it sounds like it, but it's totally different. It's, it's multiple myeloma. It's a, a bone marrow disease, a bone blood disease in the marrow. And they have been able to eradicate it out of me temporarily. Um, it will come back. And so I'm taking medications and things to, and doing what the doctor tells me to order. I do want to give a huge pull the hat off and cheer for Moffitt Cancer Center and from my local oncologist over in Fort Myers. Uh, believe it or not, I still drive back to Fort Myers every month to see him. I, I like him a lot. I like what they've done. And I saw no point in changing to a different oncologist when I got to Fort Lauderdale, especially since it's only two hours across the alley. And uh, so... But I'm doing pretty good. I'm, do, I'm on a ridiculously expensive drug that Janelle and I struggle sometimes to procure. Uh, even though with insurance, it's, well, pharmaceutical companies can be a real beast. That's all I'm going to say about that for right now. Uh, but anyway, I'm doing pretty good. and pretty happy with, with the way I, way I feel right now. Um, and thank you all. Thank you for all your support and your continued kudos and pats on the back. It's, it's needed, and I really appreciate it. I had the most wonderful weekend in a small town last weekend uh, up in Lake County, which is a little bit north of Orlando, uh, called Mount Dora. And I had never been to Mount Dora before, although I found out that many other people have. Because <laughs> when I mentioned it, I got emails and all kinds of things back. Oh, Mount Dora, it's really cool. It is really cool. Um, Lake County, in the region that it's in, it's in the lake region. There are lakes all around you really large lakes, in, including, you know, Lake Dora. But it was, um, we went up there for a reason. Uh, we went up for a um, Scottish Highland Festival. And uh, Janelle and I are both quite Scottish. Um, as a matter of fact, for those that don't know, I play the bagpipes and started playing the pipes way back when I was about 10 years old. I learned in Dunedin, Florida, which is the one of the sister cities of, of Scotland. And, uh, so I like going to these things whenever I can. A, a few years ago, before COVID, Janelle and I went to the Fort Lauderdale uh, Highland, Highland Games, and we really loved it. We loved it. We enjoyed it. And then, of course, COVID hit, and that wiped it out for the next two seasons. It's coming back. We're going to go on March, I want to say fifth. So it's right. It's not, not not this weekend, but the following weekend. Looking forward to that one. That was a good game. It's really good game. So I'm looking forward to that one. Mount Dora, the Highland Games. They're, they're on their ninth annual. Um, and grabbed my kilt and put it on along with about a, oh, I'd say a third of the crowd, you know, dressed up. Good chance to wear your kilt. Don't laugh. They're comfortable. Also in cool weather, they keep you warm. Um, and no, I won't tell you what Scots wear under the kilt. You have to figure that out yourself. Mount Dora was interesting. It had, it was the coolest downtown. It's very hilly, uh, because you're sitting up on the side, basically of an enormous lake. And it, it just, you know, it's it's up and downs and overs and unders and that kind of stuff, small alleyways. But most of the time you're, you're walking uphill and sometimes you're headed downhill. So it's very interesting. There's a, a, a tremendous mix of um, gift shops of every kind of imaginable gift. Things obviously produced elsewhere and brought in as well as local artists, uh, restaurants, small little bars, uh, the restaurants, great eateries, lots of choices as far as you know what to eat and where to eat um and and lots and lots of places to stay uh the one that really caught our eye was the lakeside inn and uh for a couple of reasons number one janelle's brother and sister-in-law uh was staying there um and along with family friends and we we didn't we didn't, we didn't work fast enough to get a room there. That is the room. That's the place to be, apparently, for the festival because it's right down the street. We stayed about 15 miles away in, uh, I can't remember the name of the town now. Anyway, about 15 miles away, and it was great. Um, the travel across was interesting because you literally have to go around about two lakes. There is no there is no as the bird flies. It's not like down here in South Florida or over in Southwest where the roads are like, board straight. <laughs> no, not up there. They they curve just like mountain roads without the mountains. They got hills, but you know, they curve. But the lakeside end is old. Um I believe I remember seeing on the on the steps going into the dining area, the big the big kind of 
local, uh, what do I call that? The center area of the, of the, of the inn. Uh, 1848 was when it was opened and, uh, it's beautiful. It's old and it's beautiful. It's really, it's unique, uh, old Florida architecture, big gabled roofs, uh, lots of wood, wood floors, stairs are tricky. <laughs> it's, it goes, the place is built down the hillside toward the lake. So you, like you may go into a, a room area, but you got to go down little bitty stairs to, to each level where they've, where they've built four or five rooms or three rooms and it goes down another level. So, uh, the stairs were weird. They're, they, I commented to Jonelle, they're not like they build them today where they have to be structured exactly at a certain height. So in my old age, I had to be careful. <laughs> Just saying beautiful grounds while we were there, they were having a wedding huge lake with all kinds of things to do. It's a place you could bring your boat, kayak. Um, of course, there's things to uh, rent. There's tours to go on. It was it was really amazing. The games themselves. Oh, what fun. I love Highland games. Lots of bagpiping. And since I play the pipes, I'm very interested in hearing what other people are doing. I think the most unique thing that started uh, a while back this is probably 10 12 years old now but it's really starting to hit the highland game market the high, the, the the scottish highland uh, festivals and games and stuff uh rock bagpipes um <laughs> there's no way to explain this unless you go well i can try bagpipe is a a loud instrument and joked about often people are like, Oh, I can't stand. Well, then you haven't heard a good piper play the pipes. That's all I'm going to say about that. Or a really good pipe band. Uh, the pipes were, I mean, for, for all intents and purposes, the original bagpipes were war pipes. They were designed to scare the enemy. Uh, they would put the pipers in, they'd start piping when they're marching across the field or headed into the city and the people in the city would go, Oh my gosh, here they come. It's pretty, you can hear them a long way off. Let's put it that way. So these rock pipe bands, what they've done is they usually have one or two pipe, usually two pipers out front, and uh, they play a mixture of old traditional music with jigs, reels, and strass bays. And what those are, that's dance tunes. That's the ones that you hear. You know, um, the scene from Titanic, which this is actually Irish, of all the people dancing below decks to the violins, and or the uh, fiddle in this case, and, and accordions and stuff, that's what old Scottish pipes do with jigs, reels, and strass bays. It's that same type of you want to get up and dance to it type music. They have added that to bass, rock drums, rock guitar, and keyboards. So you've got the bagpipes out front, and you've got this whole craziness of a regular good old-fashioned rock band going on in the back. Bagpipes are hard to adapt to certain tunes because they only have nine notes. There's not sharps. There ain't no flats. There's one scale, a scale of eight, you know, from the, your typical A to A in this case. And then there's an extra G thrown in at the bottom. So you have a nine, nine scale, nine note instrument. But turns out there's a lot of real simple rock songs that follow that pattern. And I play guitar and we jokingly call that three chord rock. You know, you only have to learn three chords to play a lot of rock songs. And that's why the bagpipes are able to deal with this. And it is a very unique, fun sound. So while we had the usual stuff on stage, pipe bands coming in, I think there were three, maybe four pipe bands. We also had singers. We had artists that were doing old folk. We had a couple of guys that were doing some right funny uh, Irish and Scottish tunes uh, with guitar and piano, keyboard. Uh, then came this, this rock bagpipe band. Um, Celtica was the name of it, Celtica Nova. Uh, you can look it up on uh, YouTube, Celtic, C E L T I C A, Celtica Nova. Um, they pretty much looks to me like logo wise, they just go by Celtica. They also had a guest star, Chelsea, Chelsea the Piper, Chelsea the Insane Piper. <laughs> she was very, very good. Um, check them out, go on YouTube and pull this stuff up and take a listen and see what you think. I, I loved it. I absolutely loved it. I think it's a, an integral part of, uh, Highland festivals, um, to kind of bring people in that really don't understand the bagpipe or the music for that matter. Um, Highland music, Highland dance music in particular is very, very wild and crazy. There ain't a whole lot of sad going on, even during, um, wakes and funerals. Those, those tend to be, uh, a little quiet at times, but mostly uproarious with um, lots of scotch, lots of malt. 
Um, so I really enjoyed that part of it. I noticed I looked ahead to the Fort Lauderdale event that's coming up on the 5th, and by golly, they've got a rock bagpipe band for that one too. Sorry, I can't remember the name right off the top of my head, and it's not where I can grab it. But I just I thought, wow, this is really great. This is kind of a thing. And Janelle and I have seen a couple other acts like that over time. Um, one of the better ones was uh, Scary Vore, which uh, I'm not even going to begin to try to spell that for you. Uh, they were here in Fort Lauderdale. And same thing, bagpipe, rock band, full stage concert. And it was it was just unbelievable. We also have seen the Red Hot Chili Pipers. <laughs> we did that in Fort Myers before we left. The Red Hot Chili Pipers, not, yeah, you got it. Uh, same thing, fantastic. Really a lot of fun on stage, did a lot of unusual songs. I, you know, I've heard, I've heard these bands do the theme from Star Wars. I've heard them do a lot of other really unusual things, as long as a really good mix of rock and roll uh, with bagpipes. So if you get a chance, take a listen, jump on YouTube. Uh, just If you look up Rock Bagpipes, I'm sure you'll find all kinds of uh, different bands and things like that. The Scottish games there were good, really good. Um, we enjoyed the Tartan, March of the Tartan, the Tartan clans as they marched through the street. Uh, let me explain a little bit about that. Tartan, Tartan, yeah, Tartan versus plaid. You never, ever call a kilt plaid. It's a Tartan. The tartan represents a family in Scotland. The colors are very important. Um, every clan in Scotland, every family in Scotland had their own colors. And I'm sure you've heard of the McGregors or the Campbells, things like that. My clan is Donachy. Donachy is um, more or less Gaelic for Duncan, uh, which is also a derivative of the Robertson family. Jonelle's is Farkason. And loosely attached to Buchanan, I think. But I think she's mostly Farkasson. And each one of us have, each, both of us have kilts of our particular family color. Um, and they, so they have a March of the Tartans. They have the big families come in behind uh, their banner. And their banner will have um, their motto. And then it'll have a, uh, a, a tan, tar a, a, a color of the tartan. And they can be bright yellow, red, purples. It's, it's really amazing the different colors that uh, that the clans have. So that was fun. I love the mass bands when the, all the pipes get together in March. That's very impressive. That's again, gets back to my roots of, oh, here they come and we're all going to die. Um, <laughs> so, but I enjoy it. I really do. And of course, I've listened to bagpipe music since I was 10 years old because when you play them, that's just what happens. You start to get hooked on it. Um so anyway, it was a lot of fun, and I'm very much looking forward to Fort Lauderdale. And then after that, in early April, comes the creme de la creme of uh, Highland festivals and games, and that is going to be over in Dunedin on the west coast of Florida. Um, that is a big one. I think this is the 54th year for that one. It is a huge festival. As a matter of fact, most rooms in the area are already booked. Janelle and I are going to go. Um, honestly, this is really wild. I have not been since the first one 54 years ago. <laughs> I actually competed in that one uh, in bagpipes. I did not win. As I, I actually did, I remember doing two different things. I competed in the March, which I came in fourth or fifth, and then I did the Stras Bay Reel com com uh, competition. And as I remember, maybe eighth or ninth out of 25 Piper, I, it, it just, it was not my day. But, I can honestly say that I actually performed and was at the very first uh, Dunedin Highland Games. And it's bizarre to me to think that was 54 years ago. I'm like, holy cow. I'm getting so daggone old. Anyhow. Oh, I almost forgot. The games. I, I got to talking about bagpipes. See, this, like I said, no notes today, just random thoughts. What are Highland Games? They're unique. They are like Olympics with different stuff. Way different stuff, like <laughs> tossing a caber, um, hammer throws. That does sound familiar, doesn't it? Sheaf toss, uh, stone toss. Let's get back to caber. Caber is kind of fun. Okay, so a caber, tossing the caber is, picture a telephone pole made of wood, the typical one you see on the side of the road. Uh, the contestant, who looks like a beast, picks it up. That's right, by himself. He, he picks it up off the ground, puts it up on his shoulder, puts his fingers underneath it, and lifts that sucker off the ground straight up in the air. A telephone pole, people. We're talking manly man. 
<laughs> in a kilt, <laughs> which is the coolest thing you've ever seen. Um, okay, so now they've got it up at, let's just call it 12 o'clock, and the idea is to toss it one time end over end out in front of you and make it land as close to 12 o'clock as possible. And most of the guys that got their own style, um, they'll step forward four or five, six times, kind of get the momentum going, then they'll suddenly stop. Let the, let the caber start to fall forward. As the tip comes down, they give it a big old heave-ho and pray that it goes over. A lot of times it doesn't. I'd say over half times it does not. When it does go over, it a lot of times will fall off to 11 o'clock, 10 o'clock, you know, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. It will not go straight. The guy that gets it straight is probably going to win because uh, that's just the way it is. There are, I think they toss three times. And they add up the best score based on the clock, you know, where it landed. But it is quite a sight to see. Uh, by the third toss, some of the guys have difficulty even getting the caver up on the shoulder. For me personally, that's probably one of my favorite things to watch in the game portion of Scottish or Highland gatherings, Highland festivals. Um, and and be clear. let me be clear about this. If it says like it's a Highland festival, there's a chance or you are not going to have the game part of it. If, it's, if they have games, they're going to call it. I believe Dunedin refers to theirs as the Dunedin Highland Games. That typically means you're going to have everything from bagpipes to all this other crazy stuff. Hammer throw, pretty much self-explanatory. Great big giant chunk of metal. Looks like a giant cannonball on a chain, which is swung round and round, or as they say, round and round and round, and throw it as far as you can throw it, hopefully in the right direction. As a spectator, I recommend you be far away. Um... Let's see, the stone toss, similar. The stone is a big, giant, perfectly round, boulder-looking thing about uh, uh, bigger than a cantaloupe, but not as big as a watermelon. I hope, you know, it's fun doing this on podcasts, trying to explain without pictures. Tucked up under your chin, spin round and round and round, and throw it by pushing the arm straight out as far as you can. Uh, and then the sheaf toss. The sheaf is interesting. This dates back a gazillion years to when hay was tossed up into the top of a loft to keep it out of moisture, especially in Scotland. Uh, so they would use a pitchfork. Uh, the sheaf is, is basically a, uh, a bale of hay in a pillowcase, burlap pillowcase. I hope that explains it. Yeah, you can picture that. And about the size of a, of a, of a king pillow. They stab it and they throw it over their shoulder and they try to throw it over what would normally be used as a pole vault, um, you know, bar that people would pole vault over. But they're throwing it over backwards. So they they basically try to just give it a big old toss and over it goes. Um, more clean the toss and if all the contestants make it over, they raise the bar a little bit until they finally get to the height of where the guy that wins it tosses it the highest. I think Janelle's favorite thing she told me, so I'm, this is not second, this is, you know, this is news. I didn't make this up. <laughs> the hammer throw. She loves watching huge men spin around in kilts. Ladies, just think about it for a minute. And you'll understand. I, I, there's nothing I can do about this, but I encourage you to go to games instead of just a Highland Festival. They're both fun, but if you really want to see the whole thing, uh, pick out Highland Games. The biggest, the baddest Highland game in America, as far as I'm aware, is called the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games, and that is up at Grandfather Mountain in North Carolina near Boone. Uh, right up in the, well, Grandfather Mountain's the second highest peak um, in the Blue Ridge in, in that chain. So nearby is Mount Mitchell, which is the tallest, but there's a, a, a beautiful valley up there, a beautiful, uh, oh, it's gorgeous, it's a, it's a meadow. It's called McRae's Meadow. A bunch of crazy Scots have lived up there for a very long time, and they started their games way before anybody else. I couldn't even begin to tell you which, what year it's on. I, um, boy, I started going there as a kid, so and I'm in my 60s. So anyway, it's located up there. It comes up generally. It is the second weekend in July. I have not checked the dates. They usually get by July 4th, and then they hold it. Now keep in mind, this is at such an altitude; it's not hot. Uh, the weather is absolutely beautiful in the in the Blue Ridge and Appalachian Mountains in the in the uh, summertime. Uh, very cool nights, sometimes in the 40s, and warm days, 70s to 80s, and not nowhere near the humidity that we have here in Florida. Uh, we used to travel up as a family. That was the that was actually the first games I competed at. 
I did win there. I won a gold medal there uh, in the 14 and under class, and I won a silver medal there uh, the following year. So uh, I had good luck at the, at the Grandfather Mountain Games. And it was pretty heady stuff for me because that's the big guys come in. That's Scots, Canadians, all across America, um, uh, most notably up in uh, Pennsylvania. There are a lot of big pipe bands in Pennsylvania and across all the way out to the West. So all these people show up. It is a massive deal. It lasts for a week. This is not something that just goes on for a day or two. This is really a big, big event. Uh, they have things leading up to it. I believe the games are actually two days, a Saturday, Sunday, but there's lots of stuff going on around it. And if those of you that hate the heat and you want to cool off and go do something fun, I'd highly recommend looking into Grandfather Mountain and heading up that way. Uh, you can get hotel rooms outside the area. They actually, it's gotten so large now that they have uh, buses and trams and stuff that will take you into the games. But uh, I'm going to put it on the list. We we have not done that this year. We we've talked about it, but uh, we're going to do three of them. So <laughs> that's a big up from where we were before. But but the granddaddy of them all is uh, the Grandfather Mountain Highland Games up in North Carolina. Now for my last random thought. <laughs> Thank you for hanging in there through all the Scottish stuff. I appreciate it. Uh, Jonelle and I are avid cooks. We both love to cook. I mean, I'll call her a chef. She's she's a little level above me, but we, we both love to cook, and we share duties. I do a lot of cooking during the week because she's working, and I'm retired, and then she'll usually take over on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and we'll or, or we'll mutually decide that a restaurant would be more fun. Janelle finally broke down and bought an air fryer. You know, we've all been hearing about it. We've seen it on television. We've seen people recommend it. We, you know, honestly, we had no, we don't know. I mean, to us, a microwave is still new. I'm just kidding. But it feels that way. You know, I remember when microwaves came out and people were like, well, what do you do with it? Well, you put a potato in it, poke a couple holes, and it'll be done in minutes instead of an hour. And we're like, yeah, right. And that's what it does. Never put metal in it. You know, you learn all kinds of fun things about microwaves that you really shouldn't do. But uh, I can't even imagine a kitchen without one at this point. I know we warm stuff in it all the time. So the air fryer shows up. And, I, you know, I've been hearing about this, I'm going to say, at least two years, and then just kind of ignored it and... uh and then suddenly, Janelle, she's sitting on the couch the other day. She goes, I'm going to order an air fryer. I said, okay. I said, the only thing I've heard is order a good one. Don't, don't buy cheap. Spend some money and get a decent one because I've heard people complain about the cheaper ones. So we kind of know that, and that's what we did. So we got this, this awesome-looking air fryer. It looks like it's from outer space. It's like a giant, well, it's like an egg sitting on a flat bottom. And, of course, I've read the instructions. Today's the day. Today I'm going to experiment with it. I'm going to try some frozen uh, potatoes like a French fry or tater tots in it. I'm going to try doing some wings. But I'm going to start slow. I only cook like six to eight wings in it. So I just want to see what it does. So I'm opening this up to you, the listeners. Any tips will be more than appreciated. So after you listen to the podcast, you will have my email, catchoutdoors at gmail.com, just like it sounds. Uh, some of you have my number and text and whatever that listen to this. Feel free to text any information or tips that you have. If there's a special place where you find really good recipes or maybe little things that you do in your air fryer that works better than what the instructions say, I'd like to hear it. Uh, we got one that's got the, you know, it's got the little air basket in the bottom of it. It's got a fairly large container for putting stuff in. I know about uh, things that I do know about is like stir the food occasionally. Don't just let it cook. You need to move it around. Uh, I know you don't want to block, you don't want to stack stuff up too thick. You got to leave it thin enough to make the air work around it. But I'm really anxious to see how this thing works. To me, this might be very similar to the 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 microwave. All, all of a sudden, there's just a whole nother way to cook stuff. And I personally love crispy chicken wings. I do not like gooey wings. No offense, Hooters. Hooters does they ta they taste good at Hooters, but they they're just too goopy for me. And I know they'll they'll do them they'll dry them out more if you ask. But honestly, I like a crispy chicken wing, um, you know, covered in hot sauce, yum yum. So I, I'm going to experiment. I just I want to see what this stuff will do. I we can't eat a lot of French fries. It's against our diet. That <laughs> doesn't mean I won't. <laughs> I'm interested in making uh, vegetables in it. I can I saw you can do that. I saw that you can actually um dry like potato slices and make potato chips, stuff like that. And I thought, well, this, that is really interesting. So uh, having read the manual today, it's experiment, uh, experimentation day. 
uh, and I will I'll relay to you what what happens next week. And I hope to hope to get some tips from you folks. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you taking the time to tune in. If you enjoyed the podcast, please tell a friend and share it on social media. Catch You Outdoors is hosted by Anchor and available via Spotify and Apple Podcast. Our Facebook page is, that's right, Catch You Outdoors. Our website is, that's right, catchyoutdoors.com. Until next time, get outdoors and enjoy. <laughs>